So I wanted to invite Jesse to come up to speak about the, uh, now I forgot the name of the thing because I got nervous, how to use machine learning for testing and implementing optimal networks. Okay, Thank take you. it away. So I'm uh, Jesse Simpson, I'm from Nokia Bell Labs. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators in this, Steve Plote, Marina Totten, and Peter Windsor. So I'm gonna be speaking about uh, machine learning and optical networks. And so I'm gonna be discussing machine learning applications and algorithms. And a big part of this is going to be about a network operating system because you know, we believe that this is necessary in order to have really a dynamic uh, controllable network that you can run these intelligent algorithms on top of. And a big part of the network operating system will be network abstractions that I'll be discussing. And some, uh, you know, we want to be able to collect data from the network, so I'll be discussing sensors like optical signal to noise ratio and fiber polarization sensing, some algorithms like a quality of transmission algorithm that you can use to optimize your network and reduce the margins. And then, you, of course, you want to take actions. Uh, so I'll be showing some error-aware rerouting application and uh, wrap up with some challenges and um, questions for discussion. So as we see, ubiquitous cloud services uh, will drive bandwidth and uh, dynamism in the network. And we're seeing the situation where compute resources can be instantiated in a matter of minutes, but comparable flexibility is really not possible in the IP optical networks. And there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, in your transport networks, you tend to have much more complexity in different vendors, uh, different network elements that you need to be able to control. So we have this situation where the hardware is becoming more flexible. We have uh, flex grid rotums, flexible bitrate transponders that I'll be discussing, but they're largely uh, quasi-statically configured and not really dynamically configured. So dynamic networking requires a sophisticated network OS uh, to control the network, and we need to manage and allocate resources for optical, optimal network capacity, security, and reliability. And so we need to be able to sense the network and control the optical network and we can run advanced machine learning algorithms on top of the network OS in order to do the functions that we want. So my main pitch is that the dynamic networking with machine learning requires sensors, abstraction of the network, algorithms, and actuators to actually do something. So fortunately, there's a number of communication industry efforts that are working on um, software-defined networking for transport networks like the OIF. Uh, there's the Open Daylight Controller and the Open Network OS, or ONOS, which is open source net OS from Owen Lab and the Linux Foundation. So the foundations of uh, machine learning applications, you know, underlying uh, the net OS, we have a flexible tunable network. And here I show the net OS as uh, being net Unix, which is a prototype uh, network operating system that we're working on at Bell Labs, and it's based on top of ONOS. And so now we need to be able to get sensor information from the network into the NetOS. And then we want to provide an abstracted view of the network to the algorithms that can run on top. So by abstraction, we want to you know, hide some details of the network, but also present the data that we need in order to run you know, the, the algorithms on top. So for example, optical margin reduction, we need to be getting some OSNR data and that kind of thing. So we run the algorithms on top, and then actuators actually control the network. And you may have some algorithms that could be running down on the network elements themselves, like a polarization sensor and a OSNR sensor. And I'll be discussing some of that, um, those functions as I go. So a bit of background about some machine learning algorithms. And this is kind of my fundamental dichotomy of, of machine learning. On the left side, you see an example of doing numerical optimization. And in this case, I'm, I'm thinking about having a, a model network that you, you know, you've imposed some physical model on the network, but you maybe don't know all the parameters. And so now you can run machine learning in order to tune those parameters and find out what they are. And just to give a general definition of machine learning, so a computer uh, program is said to learn from experience with respect to some class of tasks, and performance measure if the performance of the task as measured by that performance measure improves with experience. Uh, 
So that means you want to have some kind of a training or gaining of experience in order to, to learn uh, how the system works. And coming back to this example of numerical optimization, I think most people are familiar with this. In this case, you could think of something like an error function, which uh, you, you're computing something like a, a signal-to-noise ratio, and you have an error function that is comparing it to the actual um, signal-to-noise ratio that, that you measure. And now you want to run some training or optimization in order to tune some parameters in the network. And here I'm showing uh, some animation of a gradient descent algorithm. And uh, you're probably aware of this. Uh, it, with the gradient descent, you can do a derivative of the error function and then basically follow um, the steepest descent in order to minimize your error function. So in this case, the performance measure is this error function. Um, the class of tasks is that you want to minimize it. And the experience is the trajectories that you take as you vary these parameters. And um, you, know, you can think of it like a ball rolling down a hill and finding, finding the minimum of, of that error function. So in that case, you had sort of imposed a physical model on your system and you're trying to optimize it. In the other case, you can use something like uh, artificial neural networks. And this you know, has been getting a lot of press recently um, for some you know, really amazing uh, problems that it's being able to solve. And here, you're just kind of using a black box. You don't impose a physical model of, of your system. You're just basically giving it a neural network that you train from inputs and outputs. And this thing finds the transformation from inputs to outputs. It's pretty easy to describe you know, how one of these neurons works. It, it's like a, a neuron in the brain. This artificial neuron has a number of inputs. And these inputs are weighted. And then you do a summation of these weights. And you compare it. You do a threshold function. So some nonlinear trans transform here. And so if the sum of those weights are above a threshold, then that neuron fires. If it's below the threshold, then it doesn't fire. So it's simple to describe the operation of one of those uh, elements. Now the magic comes in when you combine many of them into a network. And now you've uh, got a function like a brain that can actually learn something. And so now you um, run an algorithm to find the uh, optimal weights to transform your inputs into the outputs. And here I'm showing uh, an example of uh, something I pulled off the web that of a uh, artificial neural network that was trained to complete this Mario level. And uh, what it's doing is it's using the abstracted view of the network. So there's, uh, in that gray box, you see an abstract, sorry, abstracted view of the playing field. And then these black boxes are the monsters that come through and trigger the artificial neural network to process. And uh, in the end, you have actuation, which is pressing of the, of the buttons. So the way you train these things, you know, you can think of it like the way a child learns language. Um, you don't actually sit down and, and try to describe to a child, you know, what's a subject, what's a verb, and, you know, the structure of, of language or something like this. You just keep giving it examples. You just talk to the child. You give positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and somehow it's able to learn. So it's, it, um, it's kind of a black box function, but it's able to produce something useful. So coming back to dynamic and flexible networks, um, you know, as I mentioned, we have a lot of flexibility coming in on the optical layer. We have uh, flexible client interfaces coming. We have uh, bandwidth variable transponders and channels. Uh, we have super channels in, on the optical layer, multiple optical channels that are bundled together. And we have flex grid rotums where you can vary the bandwidth uh, available for these different channels. So there's a lot of sort of free parameters here now that you can tweak. And you need some intelligence in order to be able to make good decisions on how to do that. And the other thing we want to do is improve our sensing capabilities of the network. So if there's some kind of a disturbance or an impairment, like in this case, a backhoe is digging near your fiber network, we want to sense that something is you know, uh, creating a problem, and then you can take some kind of an action if you want to. So in the end, uh, what do we want to do? We want to get the most capacity out of our WDM system as possible. And we're in this interesting situation now with optical networks where we're approaching the fundamental limits of single mode, single channel, you know, fiber um, capacity. Um, sorry, single mode fiber capacity. And we have, uh, for example, down, down in the yellow, 
We have single carrier uh, products that can change bit rate. So we can have 400 gigabit per second, 200, 250, 100 gigabit per second. And you see this trade-off between spectral efficiency and transmission distance. And this can be understood because when you have these, you know, 64 QAM, like the 400G, you have this dense constellation of points. Uh, as soon as you add some noise into that system, those constellation points start to bump into each other and you can get errors. So as you come down to 100G with QPSK, the constellation points are, are, have better spacing, and now you can get your thousands of kilometers of transmission distance. And notice that uh, you know, we're really not far from the record experiments that you see reported at conferences like OFC and ECOC, and that's really not far from the fundamental limits of the um, nonlinear fi uh, fiber Shannon uh, capacity limit. One other thing I want to note here is that um, you can add in one other knob, which is probabilistic shaping. So I show some constellations from a, a Bell Labs terabit per second field trial. And with probabilistic shaping, you don't use each constellation point with the same probability. You preferably use the innermost uh, constellation points. And this gives you a little bit more spectral efficiency or reach, but it also allows you to really kind of software fine tune what your uh, spectral efficiency is. So that green line shows how you can really move along that spectral efficiency versus transmission distance using the probabilistic shaping. And so what we want to do is, is run as close as uh, close to the Shannon limit as possible or close to the forward error correction limit. So now uh, back to the network OS, we call it the network brain. You can think of this like a cognitive global network control plane. I don't want you to be confused, this is not a neural network. Uh, the uh, net OS is a you know, complicated, uh, complex uh, Java software with many different modules. It communicates with the uh, network elements and gets data. I'll, I'll get in, go into more details about the different modules that we have in this piece of software. Uh, but what it does is it takes in the application needs like capacity, latency, security, reliability. It takes in the network state and then it makes decisions to coordinate, schedule, and control the network resources. And uh, looking a little bit more at the functions that um, the NetOS does, it has arriving intents. So intents are, uh, it's a term taken from Onos, it's uh, connectivity in the network. And so there's an intent framework, which is drawing from a network resource manager, pulls in network topology information and performance data. And of course the network as the state changes, it reports up um, to these uh, topology databases. And then in the end it configures the network. And so what you're trying to achieve here is that you can program the network without really knowing the details. Um, you know, similar to the way a, a computer operating system controls your PC, when you write some Java program, you're not worried about what, um, you know, if you, what, what type of video card you're using or something like that. So it's hiding those kinds of details. Now, uh, a bit more about this network abstraction and data models. So um, fortunately, there's also a lot of uh, ongoing work in the industry uh, looking at these kinds of vendor-independent abstract network representations. And, you know, this is an important question uh, point for the machine learning algorithms because you really need to know, you know, what information is needed to run the algorithms, how many data points are needed. If you're doing something like joint IP optical network grooming and optimization, then you need the IP optical network topology. If you're doing, for example, optical margin reduction, then you need to be getting optical signal to noise ratio data. And so there's various uh, efforts ongoing here, like the IETF has uh, specified the Yang data modeling language for modeling the configuration of network elements. Uh, the Open Rotom has uh, defined interoperability specifications for rotoms and transponders, pluggable optics. And this includes Yang data models for devices and network services. And there was an excellent uh, tutorial yesterday about Open Config and they're publishing uh, Yang data models for optical transport, uh, terminal optics, wavelength routers, and optical amplifiers. And within the ONF, there's OpenFlow, which is a common southbound interface definition for multi-vendor uh, network element control. <laughs> 
So one thing that we want to bring to this is uh, uh, something we call NetGraph, and we're, bring, we're putting that into NetUnix, and it doesn't replace any of these other efforts. What it does is it adds an explicit network layering um, and topology information into the network model. So if you look at uh, transport networks, you know, some people talk about IP over WDM. In fact, it's much more complicated than that. Um, you have multiple layers, IP, MPLS, Ethernet, uh, and then if you add an OTN, you've got many layers there, WDM. So if you don't have a consistent and a traceable um, description of your network, then you won't be able to run these algorithms on top, and that's what we are um, achieving with NetGraph. So if you look um, under the hood of, of NetGraph, you see that there's various primitives that are defined. Uh, we have links, which is like a fiber connection. We have adapters, and um, the adapters take you from one layer to another. So you need to define the layers in your network up front, define how you, can connect, how you do connect these layers together, and then you can do uh, functions like connectivity tra tracing and you know, making sure that you have a consistent view of uh, presentation of your network with all of its layering. So we have implemented uh, NetGraph Manager into NetUnix, and that's the um, red box that I've, I've circled here. It's, it exists up in the network level granularity of the NetOS. Below that you have device level granularity where you have things like flow managers, um, link managers, Below that, device drivers, so this is your device-specific adapters. And finally, um, on the bottom, you have protocols that can communicate with the different network elements. So we use OpenFlow for communicating with the SDN switches. We uh, have a REST interface that can communicate with various Nokia network elements. And um, it uh, can communicate with a net, uh, Nokia network element proxy, so the proxy does um, translation to different types, different protocols like SOAP uh, for communication with transport network elements, Telnet, SSH, uh, TCP for connection to a photonic cross-connect that, that we've developed in Bell Labs. So this net graph abstracted network representation maps to the network resources and we can populate network elements into NetUnix and gather statistics using um, the southbound interface and control the network elements. So now I'm going to move on and talk more about uh, some sensor functions. And um, first I'll be speaking about the optical signal to noise ratio uh, sensor and then about fiber polarization sensing. So this optical to signal, optical signal to noise ratio sensor uh, this work is done at the Technical University of Denmark, and I've referenced a paper here. And they're using an artificial neural network in order to translate from an eye diagram to an OSNR measurement. And the point here is that you don't want to have these expensive, um, you know, optical spectrum analyzers everywhere in your network. If you can just use a single photodiode and capture the eye diagram, then you can measure something like the variance of the, on the eye diagram and then figure out how does that uh, variance measure transform into uh, an OSNR. So they did a, a neural network with one hidden layer here and uh, showing the weights connecting them. Input, again, is the variance and these weights, and then you train it with a number of different measurements. So first you have to do the training from the measured variances to actual measurements of optical signal-to-noise ratio. Once you do the training and these weights are determined, then you can put in some unknown uh, eye diagram and get the optical signal-to-noise ratio out. And over on the right side is you know, showing that the, that the estimated, after the training, the estimated OSNR uh, using that, that detector uh, corresponds to the actual measured um, OSNR. And so, you know, again, coming back, this is an example of this kind of black box um, training that you do. You're not, you're not putting in some kind of a model here. You're just putting in a measurable input that the neural network determines how to do the transformation and gives you an output. Now, moving on to using the fiber as a sensor, uh, you know, you have this, this continental scale, global scale fiber network. Uh, 
And the motivation here is that you know, one of the, or the leading cause of network outages are fiber breaks. And so we're wondering if you can have some indicator as to whether a fiber is about to be broken, like say a backhoe is digging at your fiber and shaking it. When the fiber is shaken, you rotate the polarization of the light on the fiber. And so now if we can build some polarization sensors into the network, you could detect this kind of shaking and you know, possibly take some action or at least know where the problem was going to be. Uh, so there's, we have two different methods here. One is doing a span by span a measurement of the polarization and looking for fast transients. And that uh, gives you localization down to a span level. Alternatively, you could measure the polarization over an entire path in the network. Um, that doesn't give you the same type of localization in, in, unless you start correlating it with other paths that have a problem and then you look at the overlaps and then you could try to localize where the problem actually is. So we wanted to you know, turn the optical fiber network into a massively distributed motion, set, motion detector. And so the first method using the span by span monitoring here, we want to use the optical supervisory channel. So the optical supervisory channel, it's not, it doesn't carry customer data. It just carries maintenance data for the um, trans transmission system. But and it's a single polarization signal. And now if that fiber is disturbed, you could uh, see that the OSC channel is, has rotated. And so we were proposing that you could put in a, a single polarization beam splitter look at the two polarization you know, outputs, take the difference of those two, and you'll get some signal that shows that the polarization is rotating. And since it's terminated at each amplifier site, you'll know what span has, actually has the problem. Now one issue is this, we want it to be low cost. So this is not a full polarization state monitor, it's just a single component of the polarization. And uh, so we won't get the full reconstruction of the polarization event. But what we want to do is see how well that works. So we took uh, Peter Windsor's toy here from his childhood and just banged the fiber a bit. And we looked, we looked at it with a polarization analyzer, so you get the full polarization state uh, reconstruction. And then we put in our low cost method, which is just looking at one uh, component of the polarization. And so we expect our, our method is not going to measure as large of a polarization rotation as the um, full characterization. And so we did some statistics on it with you know, 58 impacts at different points, different polarization states, and we defined a polar, uh, figure of merit that compares our sort of low-cost measurement to a full reconstruction. And we find that it's about 60%. Um, it measures on average about 60% our method compared to the full reconstruction. And uh, so 90% of the measurements had a, a fidelity greater than 0.25. So, you know, it gives some indication that there's some um, activity happening on your fiber. And then the other method, this was done by uh, my colleagues in France. They looked at the uh, polarization path monitoring. So here you don't need to add in any extra hardware. They're just using the coherent receiver of the um, dual polarization system. So with, the, with these coherent dual polarization systems, you need to track the, polar, the incoming polarization state of the signal in order to be able to um, detect both of those uh, polarization states. So they use the um, Stokes parameters that uh, describes the polarization that comes out of that digital signal processor at the receiver, out of the FPGA, evaluate the polarization rotation speed, and if it's ro rotating fast enough, if it's above a threshold, then you can record the Stokes trace, and then they did some uh, machine learning in order to classify the event. So here's an example of an event um, of, you know, say the fiber being hit over on the lower left there. And they have this robot that can do different things like bend the fiber, um, shake the fiber, hit it, or move it up and down. So these are different events that then they do um, a machine learning to do the event classification. So collect you know, many thousands of these events for different polarization states. And now you need to define some variables that go into the machine learning, and now you train it on those variables. And uh, you have this event classification function which um, will find the function that transforms some variables. So the variables are something like, 
the, you know, one of those polarization Stokes parameters over some period of time transforms those measurements into uh, these events that they could classify. And so what they found was they needed 18 uh, different variables in order to do the event classification with 95% um, fidelity. And then once you do the event classification, you can say, well, is it a risky event? And uh, if so, you can send an alarm to the, to the controller. Now I'm gonna uh, discuss more about the um, quality of transmission algorithms and the procedure that you can use to do um, uh, quality of transmission estimation and optimization for margin reduction. So coming back to this question, like what, uh, why and when do we actually need to learn from experience as opposed to knowing what we're doing? Well, um, you know, as engineers, we, we tend to want to make uh, some kind of model of the underlying physics and then uh, predict uh, physical layer performance using that model. But you know, how good is that, is that um, model? Well, you can introduce this hybrid approach, and that's what I was discussing earlier with, uh, um, with the error function and using the machine learning and the gradient descent, where you have a physical model, and then you have some parameters that you want to fine tune using the machine learning. And you know, here the, the, the problem at hand, again, coming back to we want to squeeze the most capacity out of our optical transport system. And so you need to have an accurate prediction of what's the, what's the quality of your transmission. You know, what's the signal to noise ratio that you would expect um, for that link. If you don't do a very good job of predicting you know, how that, uh, what, what the quality of that link will be, then you have a lot of spread in your predicted performance versus the actual performance. And to account for that spread, you have to do um, add in a margin. So the margin is basically you know, some distance away from the forward error correction threshold, and you need to build into that um, your, uh, your system. You have to build in this margin in order to account for that spread. But now if you can improve your model, and tune the parameters in your model, you can reduce the spread of the actual and the predicted performance. And now if you can do a perfect job and um, use supervised learning and feedback in the system, then you can match your predicted and your actual performance and you can run with a low margin and close to the FEC threshold. So we're really talking about optimizing our system, squeezing DBs out of it, um, and every DB that you have in this planning accuracy is as valuable as a DB in coding gain. So it is, it is important. So if we look at the optical system um, margin reduction, this is, this is also work done by uh, my Bell Labs, Bell Labs colleagues in France. So they used a learning process to reduce those uncertainties in the um, quality of transmission estimation. In the upper left-hand corner, uh, it shows the life cycle of deploying um, connections or uh, wavelengths in the network. You have your initial deployment, which is using a you know, planning tool that is not very accurate, say. And so you have to put a fairly large margin in, uh, at least initially. And then as you add demands into the system, you can start doing the training and improve the accuracy of, um, of your, your parameters. So, for example, the parameters in, in this model would be the noise figures of your amplifiers and the power going into uh, different amplifiers. So, you know, ahead of time, you wouldn't know what, what all those um, values are, but now you do a training on it. Um, the learning algorithm is shown in the upper right. Start with some values of the input parameters that you expect. Make a cost function, which is comparing the um, ex the calculated signal-to-noise ratio versus the actual measured values that you, that you get in the network. And now you can do a gradient descent algorithm as described earlier to um, modify those parameters. And when you find that it converges, you have a little error that now you've got new values of the parameters and subsequent you know, demands coming in um, can now have you know, much lower margin. So that's being shown over um, 
in the lower left-hand corner where this is a, a simulated system of a European backbone network. And what they've done is add demands into the system and then start doing training on it. So without the learning, you have the red curve, which you know, shows a, a fairly large spread in the predicted versus actual um, OSNR value. So you have like plus or minus one dB that you would have to build in for margin there. Now, once you do the learning, you reduce the uncertainty in that signal to noise ratio uh, prediction, and then you can get down to a tenth of a dB. And so that basically means you, you understand um, how that network is operating, what the different you know, contributions are from the different amplifiers, and you can operate very close to the, um, to the FEC limit. In the lower right, you see different graphs that show you know, different starting conditions, like say you have some systematic error in your power measurement or systematic error in your noise figure estimation. And, but you know, as you add more demands and wavelengths into the system, then that uncertainty reduces, so the SNR error after 600 um, wavelengths being deployed with the training gets down to like 0.1 dB. So now I'm gonna discuss a bit about action. So we wanna actually do something with all of this data and algorithms that we've collected. And um, for that, we have uh, SDN testbed test in New Jersey, uh, where we have different locations throughout the building we have a bunch of servers that can run applications. Uh, we have a Photonic Cross Connect, which is a, a prototype MEM switch that is uh, under development. And then we have connectivity to another area where we have service routers and optical transport and SDN switches. And now we can you know, demonstrate these kinds of applications you know, running, running on a network. This is the... Um, demonstration of error-aware uh, rerouting. So I'm showing the front panel uh, GUI of NetUnix, and you see three switches on top and three transport boxes below. So these are, the switches are on the packet layer, uh, obviously with electronic switching, and the optical transport is a WDM system. So you see the uh, blue lines are discovered connections on the packet level from the, from, uh, the NetOS. Uh, those, logically, they're on the packet level interconnections, but physically, the, each connection actually goes down to the optical layer through the WDM system and, and back up again. And so now we use NetGraph, uh, which describes the layering in the network, to make the associations between um, links on the packet layer and links on the optical layer. I started out by setting up two intents in the network between, so between host one and two is an error aware intent, between host three and four is a regular intent. So with the regular intent, it won't respond uh, to any error condition or any condition on the optical layer unless the link fails. In the case of the error aware intent, um, we can program it so that if you have an I, a high error condition, you could do you know, prefect or postfect um, condition on the, on the optical layer, then you can take some action on the packet layer. And that's what's shown um, down below. So I've actually injected errors by um, turning the light on and off on the optical layer. So I've made postfect errors in this case. And you see a you know, yellow triangle showing that there was a high error condition. And the, um, the regular intent stays on the initial path. So even though there's post-fec errors, it's still staying on the, the initial path. It could be that there's some um, you know, tolerance in that with, by using TCP, and that's some things we've looked at. The error-aware intent has, you know, is not tolerant to these kinds of errors, and so it's been rerouted on the IP layer in response to something happening on the optical layer. So coming uh, back to our challenges and discussion points for network operators, so you all in the room, um, so we can have some discussion. So what kinds of, you know, obviously you want to have a stable and reliable network. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we um, did some event classification and had a 95%, you know, accuracy in the event classification. There's this question of, you know, how much certainty do you need for it to be useful? 
Here's another example where they, um, the experimenters uh, were classifying a different modulation format and you know, getting like 96% accuracy, 87% accuracy, how much ac accuracy is, is required. And how much, is, how much data do you need? So coming back to this question of abstraction, so how much data is enough for the basis of machine learning? Um, so you know, what data is needed at which layer of the network? So some of your machine learning algorithms could be running uh, down locally on the network element, like the uh, sensor data, the OSNR, and the polarization sensing, whereas other uh, algorithms would run on top of your network OS, more network-wide, um, you know, rerouting or um, uh, optimization algorithms. And so where do you need to bring the data in and where does it need to be presented? And then, you know, of course, there's reliability and operational impl implications to having this kind of dynamism in the network. Uh, you know, when, when does human operator confirmation need to come in for these different network operations, like a reroute condition? Uh, and, you know, with, with some operators, I, I, I assume there's some business structures, like differences between IP and optical businesses that um, these kind of operational barriers to bringing this kind of dynamism in that, um, you know, may have nothing to do with technical, but everything to do with how businesses are structured. And then, uh, of course, there's a question of outages and accountability. So if there's um, an outage, was it the problem of, of the machine learning algorithm running on top of the network operating system, or was there some faulty data that was collected, and these things would need to be debugged and um, understood. So in conclusion, we see um, cloud services driving bandwidth and, and network dynamism. And uh, you know, the main point is that uh, you know, to have these really dynamic networks with machine learning, you would need to have sensors, some you know, proper abstraction algorithms that run on top, and actuators. And so the machine learning algorithms I showed can um, be used to identify network events, uh, reduce optical system margin, optimize the network, and it can be built on top of a programmable net OS with flexible network infrastructure. And I talked about this dichotomy of the different machine learning methods ranging from kind of a black box artificial neural network um, to event classification to these hybrid methods that could use a physical model of the system and machine learning to optimize that, that model. And we've been working on the net Unix uh, prototype net OS to improve the sensing of the physical layer and um, represent the, the, the network using NetGraph. And I show some application of impairment aware rerouting. So thank you for your attention. Kristen? Yeah, we have about seven minutes. I'm here. So I have a question here. Why do you choose Art, uh, artificial neural networks just because your data set derived out of sensors is linearly non-separable and how do you even find found out like it is linearly non-separable in the first place and I have a second question on even classification again uh, is that on neural networks or have you tried any other classifiers sorry what's the, what's the second question again uh, on your even classification yeah okay is again is a neural networks or have you explored any other classifiers? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna come back to, I, I believe you're, are you, you're talking about these, these experiments? Yes. Yeah, so this was, um, right, it was using this naive Bayesian um, classification where you're assuming that, the, that there's uh, independence among these different events. So I haven't explored you know, whether that independence is actually true or not, but in fact, it's able to do the classification. So, you know, with these, uh, with these you know, tests, you, you're, you're kind of making an assumption and seeing how well it works. So it is kind of this black box that you're not sure exactly how it's working, but uh, it's doing the job for you. And then the second question, I'm sorry, it was about... Uh, On the neural networks, and just because uh, you chose it is the data derived out of sensors is linearly non-separable, right? So. Uh, artificial intelligence or artificial neural networks could be uh, used when the data is linearly non-separable. Uh, my question is, uh, how do we even figure out uh, 
the yeah. data that you derived out of the sensors is linearly non-separable in the first place. Yeah, I, no, it's, it's, it's a good question. It's, 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 a, it's a bit of a trial and error thing that, that going for a good result. And, um, you know, I'm afraid I don't have a, you know, kind of quantitative response for you, but uh, it's, it's more like, you know, trying out the, the algorithms and seeing what kind of response you get. Thanks. Uh, Matt P. Tack, Yahoo, I love what you're doing here. I think one of the interesting challenges when you talk about machine learning is an inherent train and then uh, here's my, my training set. Okay, now here's my ongoing actual data being fed into it. Assumes to a large degree that once the training period is over, that the model is set and static. And I think yeah. as network engineers, everyone in the room understands that your network is never static. Right, that right. The, the data you trained it on last week is no longer really the reality. There are, are degradations in patch panels. People bunch, bump against connectors. Uh, have you thought about how you would do a, a model in which you have essentially simultaneous, I learned yesterday and the day before and the day before that, and I am evaluating my current day against it. But at the same time, the world is different today than it was yesterday. So I'm also simultaneously having to learn what is the new state of the world. That, yeah. that trade-off, I, I think, is one that machine learning still hasn't bridged yet. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good point. And so, you know, I think it's uh, applicable to this, um, these kinds of experiments here where you have your initial deployment, then you have uh, in the life cycle, this retraining, which is which is shown there, and it's it's shown like um, like a feedback loop that's um, never ending, <laughs> and so now I, I you know in in some sense you're you're expecting that there the system is not going to be so incredibly perturbed at some point that it's going to completely fly off the rails, but. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of work that would need to go into, um, you know, see what happens. Somebody unplugs a fiber, rubs it <laughs> with their finger, plugs it back in. Now you've got um, a signal to noise ratio in the network that has vastly changed. Um, and so now the system is going to converge to some new value. So that, that's kind of like a, you know, a dynamic study that, um, you know, you could do with this, this kind of a model network, um, assuming some topology, and now throw in you know, throw in some huge loss somewhere and um, uh, see, you know, see what happens, how much do you perturb it. It's an interesting dynamic study, I think. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Hi, Jeff Tansura. Great presentation, great slides. Question, somewhere in your slides you had magic word, multi-layer. So the question, how do you normalize data across layers? And you've got service packet and optical layer with very different set of inputs and life cycles. How do you do this? Uh, yeah, so you, how, how do you normalize the data across layers, you asked? Yeah, dynamics in packet are very different than dynamics in optical networks. Yes. And have different meanings. Yes, yes, that's, that's very true. So, um, yeah, that, that will definitely have to be taken into account. So, you know, the rerouting um, experiments that, uh, that I showed here, the sensing was being done at the optical layer, and the rerouting was happening at the packet layer. So, you know, there, there wasn't kind of a complex interplay between the different time scales uh, of the different layers. So, you know, you make a good point that the optical rerouting, uh, if you're really setting up a new connection on the optical layer, it can take a lot more time than, some, you know, rerouting at the packet layer. So. Now, yeah, you're going to have to take that into consideration. Here I sort of, sure, got rid of that problem by just doing the rerouting at the, at the packet layer and collecting data from the optical layer. But um, in the future, you'll have to deal with these different timescales, yeah. Have you looked into recursiveness when you have all three layers together and what it takes actually to compute it? Uh, no, we haven't, we haven't looked at that. Thank yet. you. Hello. Oh, oh, do you have one more? Oh, there we go. Ah. Hi, Chris Spears, Facebook. Um, so what method of interaction did you have to actually get the sensor to determine PMD information, for example? And how does that tie into the predictive ability of the model to predict that you have the ground shaking, that you're about to have a fiber cut, for example? 
oh, okay, so this is for the um, polarization sensing. You are back um, here. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? So if you rely on like string telemetry or just occasional TL1 polling or some other RPC method, yeah. um, and you get that data, and how predictive can you actually be off of that? So do you sense that the ground is shaking versus uh, the ground is already you know been moved and the fiber cable has actually been shunted and like you're about to be cut or you just were cut already? How predictive can you actually be versus so there's a balance always of um, can we be predictive about something or can we be quickly reactive to something and uh, how you're measuring this is going to determine also how you know quickly you can react if it is a predictive event. Because you have to get the data into your model, then you have to look at it, then you have to analyze it, and you say, well, this is something I can act on. Can my systems to react at the upper layers actually do something yeah, in that yeah, amount of yeah, time? Yeah, 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 definitely. That's, um, it's all, those are all good points. Again, coming back to the question of time scale, and now what action do you actually want to take? How, how long does it take to do the, the classification? And you know, how, how proactive do you want to be? Um, you know, how much time do you have to be proactive? You know, I, unfortunately, I, I don't have any data that's coming from the field um, showing these kinds of, of cut events, and that's sort of an open invitation to anybody here if you <laughs> want to collaborate on um, looking at, you know, what are the time scales involved in um, seeing some kind of polarization signal happening on the fiber, you know, before a cut. So how much time do you actually have to um, make a decision? So we, we haven't really, you know, pushed that angle because we're, we're lacking in data as to, you know, how much time do you have, uh, what's typical, what's, what, you know, how do these things actually behave in the field when you, when you have a disturbance like that? So uh, we haven't really delved into time scale for reaction yet. And what open APIs are you using to operate uh, or interact with your optical systems? I'm sorry, can you please? What open APIs are you using to operate your optical systems? Oh, so for the optical system, um, we, yeah, I showed, yeah. Um, so we're using uh, a southbound interface that we add, you know, we made ourselves this REST interface that can pro um, populate devices into the, Net OS, and then it has a translation to, you know, whatever type of um, device we want, Telnet, SSH, SOAP, or TCP. Wouldn't it be great if all the optical vendors adopted open APIs? Uh, yeah, so we don't, you know, the, these, um, you know, we, there's a SOAP interface on the network management to, to go to the transport, but uh, yeah, uh, we're, we're basically doing our own thing here. Cool, thanks. Thank you very much, Jesse. We appreciate that.